Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to this conversation about what the future of learning would look like when we question human exceptionalism. Um, it raises, it builds on some of the ideas that you know came in the previous session raised by you and the title of our session. And you know, we couldn't um, resist a bad pun when we get a chance to do it. Is called uh, putting Descartes before the educational horse. Speculations on biotechnological evolution, multi-species relationships, and human exceptionalism. My name is Punya Mishra, and I'm Associate Dean for Scholarship and Innovation at the Teachers College here at ASU. And thank you for joining us. And um, this is sort of a different kind of a session where we have two award-winning science fiction writers, Simon Brown and Shiv Ramdas, and my colleague at the Teachers College, Iveta. And in some sense, you know, if you think about education uh, in the deepest sense, it is to help us understand ourselves and our place in the world and possibly, you know, help us, you know, equip us to navigate it. And if there's one thing we have come to realize deeply, and I think the previous session sort of spoke to that, is that we coexist within this complex dynamic network that is continuously evolving this web of life and nature and us. And so that, that we are of the world. But in some ways, for too long, we have sort of, as humans, separated ourselves from this, you know, as if we are unique and distinct from the rest of the world. And this Cartesian framework has become part of a dominant worldview, influencing everything from business to education. And so at the heart of this discussion are two stories. Uh, and uh, Iveta, if you could drop links to some of this stuff that I'm talking about in the chat, that would be awesome. Uh, written by Simon Brown and Shiv Ramdas which approach this issue of human exceptionality from two completely different directions. Uh, these stories were published uh, in Slate magazine as part of a series um, we initiated around thinking about imagining learning futures. And the story, uh, which is called Speaker, it questions human exceptionalism through imagining a conversation between a hyena and a human. And I really recommend this story for just how sweet and funny yet profound it is. And Shiv's story, The Trolley Solution, focuses on educational artificial intelligence and what that would mean in this world of the business of education, so to speak. And rounding off this trio is Dr. Iveta Silova, um, who has explored the possibilities of education beyond the human through speculative thought experiments and her scholarship, uh, and what it means to reconfigure a relationship with this more than the human world. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Katina, our moderator today, who was one of our uh, responders on, on Shiv's story. And uh, I think uh, Iveta will drop some links so that you can go and look at and read the stories and the webinars and the responses that emerged out of that. So Katina, feel free to jump in because you are as much a part of this conversation as the, the rest of us. Thank but you. without further ado, because you're not here to listen to me, um, let's jump in and, and, and talk to our, our first starting with our two science fiction authors. So Simon, I'm going to start with you. Uh, very briefly, tell us a little bit about yourself, but more importantly, for those who haven't read the story, uh, give us a summary without revealing too much and particularly focusing on this issue of how it questions human exceptionality. So Simon, let's start with you. Um, I'm, I'm a full-time writer um, and have been for several decades. Um, my writing is, is principally speculative fiction, that is science fiction, fantasy and horror, but also I do um, journalism for universities and charities and maintain a blog. Um, the story speaker uh, came about as, as, as because of a contest being run by Sapiens Plurum, an organisation that looks into expanding and exploring human potential. And it deals with um, an organisation called Project Sentience. Its objective is to explore sentience in non-human creatures. And to achieve this, they... Um, insert uh, protein biochips into the brain of a human speaker and partner that with um, a chosen member of another animal group. In my case, it was a hyena in the case of the story. And the story is basically how the two, the human and the hyena speakers, have to learn to cooperate together to save the life of a child who's been lost in the veldt in South Africa. Um, uh, that They have to overcome differences in concepts, language, understanding, uh, and of course, what the different needs is. I mean, it was as soon as the, the human gets in touch with the hyena and says, "Want you to find a child," and the hyena's first response is to eat it. Um, but you know, it, it, it develops from there. So it, it is basically about the, the, the 
about the desire we had to communicate with other species and some of the problems that can arise from it. Thank you, Simon. Um, and really, I mean, uh, it's impossible to capture without actually reading the story, the richness and, and just the humor um, that's in it. Uh, but with that, I will um, on to you, Shiv, and same prompt, tell us a little bit about yourself and a brief synopsis of the story, uh, particularly focusing on how it questions this idea of human exceptionality from a very different direction than sort of Simon um, led into it. Sure. Uh, first of all, I apologize for the camera. I don't think it's going to work without me sort of bailing on the meeting halfway through. So please bear with the sound of just my voice. Um, I've been writing science fiction for a while now. Um, as you know, I did this project for you like in uh, sometime last year. Before that, I had written a novel and some short stories. My short fiction has been nominated for a few awards here and there. Um, and I've essentially been involved in the field of writing science fiction and related stuff for about close to a decade now. Uh, to come to the story itself, it, it was an interesting proposition being from India because like, we have an extraordinarily intensive education system in its own right, especially at the levels leading up to higher education. Uh, higher education is not quite as intense relatively, but school is terrible in India. It's an ordeal. So I wanted to sort of capture a little bit of that. And essentially, it's a story which is set in a university dealing with the most common current problem of universities, which is people who are not involved with education deciding how much money people who teach should get and how much money is allocated to programs. So it's essentially set in a situation where we have a creative writing teacher who is told that he's essentially going to be teaching for his job this semester in a teach-off against another teacher. That other teacher happens to be an AI. So we have the proposition of an AI attempting to teach human students creative writing over a long distance medium. And we have the human teacher who is also trying to do this while outdoing that other AI to keep his job in what he thinks is collusion with an ally in the office itself at the administrative level. So without getting too much detail and too much spoilers, we essentially see various facets of this interplay, so to speak, between the three or four elements we have here, like the student body, the two teachers, and the administrative area. And we essentially, it sort of tries to compare and contrast, like without essentially demonizing AI as an educational tool itself, because that is something Honestly, I feel quite strongly about its use and its efficacy in certain aspects there. So without doing that, some of the challenges that are presented by AI, some of the advantages it may present, similar situation in the context of the human teacher. And finally, we just tied a large little bow on it by letting everyone know that, um, should I just spoil it all the way? Might as well, right? Um, that essentially the big bad administrator who's been cutting all these costs all along is also an AI who has replaced all the human administrators already. So it's turtles all the way down. Thank you. Thank you, Shiv. And again, I think the beauty of reading the actual story, I mean, this is why I think our spoilers don't spoil anything because good authors, what they do is they, they provide a richness in and a nuance in the story itself that is goes beyond, I think, the twist at the end or whatever you may call it. So, so I don't think it's a spoiler in any sense. And I still recommend that anybody who gets a chance read both these stories. Uh, but I want to turn to my colleague, Iveta, who, I mean, Iveta, I have to say this, that you have really uh, been instrumental in transforming my way of thinking about this idea of human exceptionalism. I had some vague thoughts about it, but I think you sort of instantiated and made them concrete in a way that were really powerful. So I'd love to um, sort of hear from you. Uh, firstly, tell us a little bit about yourself and your scholarship um, and how that line of work connects with the themes and ideas that these stories present. Uh, because I think you have some very um, deep and, and, and very thoughtful and insightful ideas about these. Thank you, Punya, and thank you everybody else. But first, I wanted to ask if it's actually Shiv talking or is it Ali? 
the black void good the point. empty void that's what i we think see it's too. it's it's gpt3 generative ai you know <laughs> model shift speaking there just asking <laughs> what have you done without shift send him back <laughs> you will never know the answer will you no <laughs> we, we never will guess. we can only speculate <laughs> anyways but um it's wonderful wonderful to be here my name is um iveta and uh, so i have been working playing with uh, these ideas for quite a while and uh and have been kind of very intuitively drawn into the um um science fiction in particular in thinking about education and the future of education and i think my um attraction to science fiction is because it's such a, a powerful uh trigger to just think outside of the box and you know try to really very radically reimagine what education um could be like because i find that in um in the field of education whether we do research on k12 or universities you know the idea of modern schooling in particular is so deeply entrenched in our imagination that it's almost impossible to imagine alternatives and uh, and in fact every time we even begin criticizing the like this kind of larger big idea of modern schooling it very often uh, meets us with a very harsh critique including you know people questioning whether you are anti public education or anti equity because uh, modern schooling is really viewed as a great equalizer so it's very difficult to find entry points into this very radical critique of schooling and i find that the uh, science fiction um more broadly but the very specifically the stories the two stories that Simon um and Shiv uh shared with us through this project uh as really powerful and wonderful openings into this critique and also radical um imagination and so i have been playing on the edges you know trying to find different angles on how you know to approach this critique of schooling and open um you know maybe more productive and meaningful conversations about this reimagination and it's very difficult to find these openings but the the science fiction is one of the really productive ways i personally find and in fact i now um regularly use um sci-fi in my almost in every courses i teach and i find you know i find it super refreshing and uh very intellectually stimulating and um so yes i'm happy to be <laughs> really happy to be in this conversation thank you veda and i think this is one thing that fiction does right which uh, most of our academic writing can't do is this this sense of empathy that it can bring in um and 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 so that leads sort of to my second question which is one of the things that you know when we talk about sort of the decartan schism between humans and others is the sense of the other and i think that what both these stories do in some in some powerful ways is humanize the other um so you know in the hyenas in one case you know um if i without revealing too much without um sort of understanding this idea of humor or you know how you go from i mean in in some ways what i think simon is like really profound in your story it's not just that the humans understand the hyenas it's the end of the story really is that the hyenas understand the humans in some way uh in, in some aspect of humanity um in in ways that are really profound and i think shiv now that you reveal everything i know um um but i think that there is this this aspect of you know that that if we look at the other whether it's nature whether it's technology that i think both these stories do is try to bridge that gap and i know eveta you have thought a lot about this these divisions between the humans and the rest of the world and that we have placed ourselves on a pedestal so i'm going to actually start with you on this one and then go back to shiv and uh, and simon is can you talk a little bit about sort of the implications of this split right because i think there are some profound when we look at climate change when we look at a lot of the political discourse that we have around these issues um whether it's critiquing school or whatever 
I think those are really important topics. So maybe you can speak a little bit from sort of the academic perspective that you bring and we'll open it up then to Shiv and Simon. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I enter this conversation, as I said earlier, you know, from the field of education. And actually I do view schooling as a very deeply implicated in the very many crises that we currently face, um, including the climate crisis. And partially um, it is because it is exactly through um, schooling, um, starting very early, as early as kindergartens, that we begin teaching to um, ourselves, our children, uh, you know, anybody who enters this schooling as an institution that um, not only that we are separate from nature, but also that we are on the top of the hierarchy and uh, in a way justifying the exploitation of um, nature and um, other species for our own benefit, right? It's also in, you know, through schooling where we learn um, that um, individualism, hierarchies, hyper separation, that it's all natural and good, that progress and development are infinite. And uh, all we have to go basically, all we have to do is, you know, go follow the arrow of time and, you know, we will eventually arrive to a better future. And, uh, and so it's obviously uh, really problematic. And um, so for us to shift off this trajectory of climate um, emergency and um, environmental collapse, I think it's really important to, you know, radically reimagine these um, and reconfigure the, you know, these um, fundamental assumptions about what education is who we as humans are and how we relate to not only other humans and other species, but also to uh, the world more broadly. And uh, it's a, a really, it's a really difficult process. And so in the, like I said earlier, it's so difficult to enter into this discussion and really challenge these root metaphors. So some of the people in the environmental education like, um, or environmental humanities, um, people like colleagues like David Orr, but you know, many others talk about these um, concepts that I just mentioned, hyper separation or the, the viewing the world as a machine or individualism, they talk about these concepts as root metaphors that um, basically shape how we think about education. And um, so unroot uprooting these metaphors, uh, shifting these metaphors, uh, maybe erasing some of them and, and replacing and reconfiguring them is a really urgent task because uh, I think as we have seen, more of the same education really is not um, leading us anywhere far. But still, all of the discussions at the global level, for example, around SDGs are based on the assumptions that all we need is more education, maybe more better access to education and more um, education of higher quality. But I have mentioned it in you know, many other, on many other occasions, at this point in history, the world is the most educated it, it has ever been, yet we are the closest to the environmental collapse, right? So it's obviously wow. the type of education that we are currently offering or um, betting on is not helping us much. So it's this radical imagination that we need to really to be able to survive. And that means overcoming the these really coming to terms that these root, root metaphors are not working and really thinking about um, other ways of thinking um, about who we are and how we relate to, to the world around us. All right, thank you, Aveta. So I'm gonna um, shift, I, I love this idea of the root metaphors and something that came up in the conversation, Katina, if you remember with Shiv, was one of the things Shiv you talk about in the sort of implied in the story is this, hidden systems that actually control what we do. So even though we might be thinking that we have free agency, but there are structures and systems which 
um, determine that. So um, I'm looking at the time. I would love to leave some time for questions. So Shiv and I, Simon, I want to give you the last word. So I'll go with Shiv first. Shiv, can you speak a little bit about this idea that it's a theme in your story about these hidden structures that guide us without our being ever, even realizing that we are being manipulated or we are being pushed in certain directions in terms of the kinds of decisions that we make, even though we might think that we have free agency there. Sure. Um, well, in the context of the story itself, a lot of that is depicted through a specific administrative AI that like sort of, it doesn't directly impersonate a human, but the story isn't exactly directly clear with you either as to what you're dealing with. So it's a bit of a gray area there. And so it was also a little bit of an interesting like viewpoint in terms of like how your decision matrix affects your levels of control or agency in a situation. Like in the sense that just the belief you are dealing with a human being at the other end of a give and take or, or and give and take in a highly capitalistic sense, in the sense where you like you give and they take. But um, the fact that that entity you're dealing with is not actually a human affects great deal. And a great, uh, uh, there's a huge amount of like emotional planning that we tend to do when we engage with other human beings. Like there is some amount of like management of their emotions that a lot of people tend to do. Like you see how the person you're giving a presentation to is reacting on their face. And therefore, you know, you scale up, you scale down, you stop and say, let's do questions or whatever. There's a lot of reading the room happening. And that, that, that just gets taken entirely out of the equation, right? Maybe we'll get to a point where we can actually start reading like visual cues from AI, but we're not there. So to contextualize this actually to what we were discussing earlier, I actually think like in terms of agency, we're at this really interesting stage in like human history, so to speak, where we realize that we may be as species on earth go relatively forward thinking, but we're not adequately forward thinking for our own good or for the good of the planet. So at the end of the day, we're still like in danger of a lot of trouble. And it's, as we talked about like paradigm shifts, like I think we've spent the last couple of hundred years very, if we can talk about like scientific temperament and like focus, temperament is a word I prefer to focus in this context is We've been very STEM focused for the last couple of hundred years. And we honestly probably want to shift a little bit more to being humanities focused for the next, however much period of time. And I think that will actually probably help us balance it out a little bit. But because again, like a lot of the STEM focus tends to be from a specifically capitalistic exploitative resource versus what we can take and how much we can take without ever giving back and so on and so forth. So essentially we need to get a really a lot better at balancing the ledger, right? Like right. we're doing a lot of taking and very little giving. Thank you, Shiv. So I think um, Simon, I think that I'm going to give you sort of a two for it here. So one is you know, the project sentience that is there in your story, it is part of this mega corporation, which is sort of alluded to, which sort of, you know, sort of fits in with the point that Shiv was making. But I think one of the things that in your story, which um, sort of stood out was there was this sort of sense of hope at the end, yeah. right? That that if we recognize the other, if we learn to listen, and I'm thinking of Iveta, the title of your response uh, to Simon's story is that if non-humans can speak, you know, can learn to speak, can we learn to listen? Mm -hmm. So Simon, I'm going to give you the last word uh, because we are at, you know, four minutes uh, to the end of our half an hour. Um, to whatever your thoughts are to sort of help us close out this session and maybe get a question or so possibly. So that's a well, tall I've, order in terms of time. Go for it. Well, after, after listening to a veteran ship, what, what, what occurs to me is that for a species that pats itself on the back for its creativity and um, despite the fact we have the capacity to deal with climate change, we haven't got the imagination to deal with. Um, it should say that we're, that we're not seeing far enough into the future. And I think, <laughs> ironically, this shows our, our extraordinarily close links with hyenas, um, elephants, slime, mold and ants, is that, you know, our, our focus is very much tomorrow, not next year or next decade. Now, we are an animal. 
And the sooner we recognise that, the sooner perhaps we can actually make progress in securing the planet's health and future for all organisms, not just ourselves. Because if the others die off, uh, we're the next one on the list. Thank you, Simon. I was hoping for a positive vibe from oh. you. And that's well, let's do up. it. Yeah, let's. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you. That was that was that was perfect. And Katina, I know we have two minutes, so I'm going to pass the baton to you for any thoughts or to get any questions. Well, we could have gone on for another hour. I know that. So. We enjoy listening to all of you. I mean, who is more entertaining? I don't know. I, I, I listen to all of you so carefully. And uh, we just go back to the human hierarchy uh, and the uh, environment and the shifting that's occurring. Uh, STEM or non-STEM, it's anyone's guess, isn't it, Shiv? But we have been focusing our grants uh, on the STEM side, particularly in academe. But the question may well be back to Yui's observations of this interaction between uh, living things, uh, inclusive of plants. Uh, let's put plants and trees into the, into the, the, the core here, uh, river systems and everything else that now has uh, a legal license uh, not to be polluted. It has a voice now through legislation in some jurisdictions. So we can look at the interaction. It's not just, as we said, Don Norman's wonderful human-centered design, which we started off uh, in the first session with Bridget when we started to talk about everything human-centered and moved away. Uh, and Iveta, you brought that home very clearly towards environment-centered or any other centeredness. Uh, Yui, you also mentioned that in your post-human analysis and theoretical framework. So we're starting to see a tie here, a movement away from the human, perhaps in it towards something in a socio-technical system, where we start to look at the interaction between all of these subsystems uh, and entities, and uh, we start to give uh, life and voice to all of these things. I think uh, the, the 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 incredible things you've raised uh, and the wizardry of your moderation, Punya, uh, it doesn't escape any one of us. Uh, it's always in the question, and you always ask the right questions. But going back to the root metaphor. We kept coming back to this root metaphor, and we can go back to the iceberg model, right? Root cause analysis, um, then mental models, and mental models are the hardest things to change. We all know that. Our behaviours are very, very much entrenched. Our ideologies are entrenched. Uh, and then that next layer up, structural change, patterns and trends, and then the tip of the iceberg. Well, I think you've pointed right down to the mental model shift that's required and testament to your craftiness. Shiv Ramda, Simon Brown, your amazing writing, Iveta, your insights, incredible insights uh, that are so rich and thought-provoking. And Punya Mishra, the magician, thank you so much for the brilliance of your moderation. Uh, thank you, Karina. And I know um, if I were the next group presenting, I would be worried how long are these guys going to go on. So I'm going to pass the baton. But I really do want to thank Simon and Shiv and Iveta for joining us and and always enjoy their company and it's great to see them thank you punya for looking after us thank you for having thank us you. yeah except that i don't know if it's shiv on the other side so <laughs> you will never know <laughs>